Telecom several times as, company, as a company. My main area of expertise is uh, environmental microbiology and biotechnology, and I use this knowledge to basically help into developing uh, products for water and soil remediation. And in case you are not familiar with our company, we are actually celebrating 20 years. Uh, and we are basically based in Trusser Triangle Park in North Carolina. And uh, we are famous because we are the original developers of the emulsified vegetable oil technology to treat uh, chlorinated compounds using bioremediation. However, we also uh, sell other products that treat other types of contaminants, for example, hydrocarbons, explosives, etc. All of them uh, using the same technology. So the reason why we advocate for bioremediation is because uh, it's advantageous at, very, uh, at, uh, at many different sites and it has several advantages. First of all, it's a long-lasting technology. That means that it requires uh, less injection events, for example, and it can transition smoothly to monitor natural attenuation once uh, the contaminant is removed by the bacteria. And also, uh, compared to other technologies, it offers no rebound. That means once the bacteria are able to get into the contaminant and degrade it, it's gone for good. So in this presentation, we are going to cover this process. Uh, we are going to focus on what is called uh, the enhanced reductive chlorination, and is the removal of chlorinated compounds using some special bacteria. So these bacteria are able to respire on uh, chlorinated compounds such as perchloroethylene, PCE, or trichloroethylene TCE, and they are able to remove some chlorine, uh, some chlorine atoms uh, and eventually reaching uh, non-hazardous products such as ethene or ethylene. So this is the main process that we will cover today. And because it involves bacteria, and you know they are living things uh, like us, basically there are several requirements for uh, uh, very good or fast biological activity. The first one is quite obvious. We need to have acceptable bacterial concentrations. If you don't have bacteria, you don't have the process happening. And um, most of the people in the field agree that uh, around 10 to the 7 cells per milliliter is a good concentration to achieve fast rates. Besides having the bacteria, they need to basically be happy. They have to be at good conditions. For example, pH has to be close to optimal, between 6.5 and 7. Ideally, there should, be, there should not be uh, other competing reactions or inhibitors, and this is an important thing that unfortunately happens a lot in the field, that we have other co-contaminants, such as 1,4-dioxin, 1,1-TCA, uh, etc. And ideally, uh, there should not be there, and uh, if there are other remediation treatments happening at the same time, or sometimes by remediation also takes care of them, but uh, we, also, we really need to think about the strategy there uh, for a smooth remediation to happen. The substrate has to be well distributed as well. Uh, many times we also give pre a presentation about that because uh, uh, substrate distribution is quite complex, but basically the food has to reach the bacteria so they are able to perform the job properly. And uh, the focus of today's presentation, the bacteria need enough nutrients. And this is quite important because it's uh, sometimes overlooked and uh, it's also a very important factor here. And the reason why nutrients are important, uh, you can think of them as us, basically, we need several elements in order to, well, to live and to perform our functions properly. And we have two kinds of uh, elements in this case. Uh, on the left side, you have uh, basically the macro elements or the elements that are essential for growth because they are the building uh, blocks of the molecules that we have or the bacteria have. And you have uh, elements such as carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and the rest of them to have all of these uh, macromolecules. And on the right side, we have elements that maybe they are needed in smaller quantities, but they are similarly important. In this case, uh, we have uh, many minerals that are involved in processes such as uh, basically uh, building enzymes and to uh, have or to provide some redox control as well, which is important too. And in this case, in the case of reductive dechlorination, one very important one is cobalt, because we will see later it's essential to synthesize vitamin B12, which is a very important component to achieve reductive dechlorination. 
One important thing to note is that we only, need, I mean, we need to have these elements, but we also need to have them in the right proportion. And uh, this is a very complex topic because, yeah, sometimes uh, elements in excess can be bad as well. And so we normally need to follow some proportions or ratios. Um, because they are complex, many of these ratios are often empirical, but several scientists have approached uh, some ratios that can be useful to, at least as a first approach, to know how much nutrients we need. And in this case, uh, one of them is the red field ratio, which basically tells us that uh, all living things, uh, for every 100 atoms of carbon, you need around 10% of nitrogen and 1% phosphorus. So, as I said, following uh, similar approaches uh, is a good start to know where the proportions that we have or we need for uh, actual bacterial growth or living growth in general. Coming back to the process of ERD, basically uh, this is where the nutrients take part there. And one important thing to mention here is the fact that normally this process can be divided into two stages. And this is important because from PC to DC, the process is quite flexible. Actually, there are many microorganisms that are able to perform this job. So this is a more resilient uh, process. These bacteria are able to grow more rapidly. They can use several substrates, for example, hydrogen, acetate, or any other carbons. Uh, to provide or to get sorry, uh, nitrogen, they can utilize several sources. For example, they can use atmospheric nitrogen, uh, dissolve nitrogen sources such as ammonium, and they can, pro uh, they can produce sorry, uh, vitamin B12 as well. As long as there is a cobalt source, they are able to basically thrive on that. In contrast, the part from DC or the conversion from DC to ethene is more uh, strict in a sense. There are only a handful of microorganisms that are able to perform this job. Uh, one of them is the Halococoides species. Uh, there have been recently some others that have been identified, but really you can count them with your hands. So that's uh, very important because they have to be there. And compared to the first stage, these microorganisms grow at a slow rate they are, I would say, more picky in this case. Uh, they only use only hydrogen as electron donor. That means that many carbon sources uh, by themselves cannot provide uh, the electron donors needed to perform this process. They cannot fix uh, atmospheric nitrogen. They require uh, this whole source of, uh, ni uh, of nitrogen. And also they, also they need an external source of B12. And going deeper into the importance of nitrogen and B12, we can say that, well, as I said before, nitrogens are very important to synthesize proteins and nucleic acids. And uh, in this case, sometimes uh, nitrogen has to be first assimilated through atmospheric nitrogen or uh, some phase molecules have to be provided. The important thing here related to ERD is the fact that some laboratory studies uh, from uh, many important research groups have found that under control conditions, a microbial community can actually thrive and perform the whole complete uh, uh, ERD. So as long as there is a source such as atmospheric nitrogen, they are somewhat able to thrive. However, and you can see on these graphs, basically, if you provide an actual dissolved source already of nitrogen, such as ammonium, you are able to shorten the time that it takes for complete uh, ERD. Basically, uh, from 150 days, you can reduce that uh, time to, to achieve a complete ERD by around five times. Therefore, uh, dissolved uh, nitrogen can help grow, uh, basically increase the rates of the chlorination. Similarly, for vitamin B12, uh, something similar happens. Uh, as I said before, uh, vitamin B12 is used to synthesize uh, the enzymes responsible for ERD. And uh, basically, the halococoides cannot synthesize it. That means that it has to be provided by other microorganisms or be present on site, or in our case, well, uh, injected. And you can see here on these graphs that adding vitamin B12 in the solution. Uh, this is also a laboratory study performed by uh, Jan and others. You can see in the graph uh, below that when there is not enough vitamin B12, 
you will see what is called a, basically an intermediate stall, or in this case, vinyl chloride stall. So the process just gets stuck in these uh, intermediates, and they begin to basically accumulate, and they don't degrade further to ethylene, which is the goal. Uh, however, when you provide enough uh, vitamin B12, this uh, stall is overcome, and uh, basically ethylene is produced. So having this knowledge uh, that was uh, obtained in laboratory, well, uh, we need to apply it uh, on site because that's what we are looking for after all. <laughs> so here I'm showing a case study where actually the nutrient addition helps to overcome all of these problems. So this is a, what we call a very challenging site, and uh, it's located in North Carolina. So. The main issue there was, uh, as you can see, the high concentrations of uh, PCE and TCE, 10,000 microns per liter and 1,000. However, there are other uh, issues there. One of the main ones is the fact that uh, next to these sites, there was a, a sulfuric acid plume that was migrating to this site. That means that basically we were having uh, pH issues. You can see the pH was around, well, on average was five, but there were some that had even lower pH. So we have that, and also high concentrations of sulfates, which is another electron acceptor, so sometimes it's competing with the, with the process here. And naturally, uh, the molecular biology tools uh, told us that, well, basically, there are less than 10 cells per milliliter. So basically, there was no way bioremediation was going to happen there, at least naturally. Nevertheless, the project manager decided that it was the best option to do bioremediation, mainly because of the size of the, of the site and also because uh, it's a... Uh, compared to our technologies, it's a bit more affordable and, uh, as I said before, it's long-lasting. So uh, the strategy was developed here. First of all, we needed to inject the bacteria there, so a pigmentation culture was used, along with a substrate, in this case, emulsified vegetable oil, as well as a, a way to control the pH or to increase it, and in this case, colloidal buffer or COBOF, uh, one of our products, was used. So through this strategy, we were able to, first of all, increase the, the Holocovitus population in site, so that's one thing, obviously. And then during the first years, we had uh, excellent PC and TC removal. You can see during the first two years, the concentrations uh, are uh, decreasing or decreased for about uh, three orders of magnitude. And you can see that the intermediates, DCE and vinyl chloride, increase in concentrations. However, you can note here, obviously, that there was uh, an accumulation here that was happening and it was not decreased with, uh, well, from a regulator's perspective, it's uh, kind of an issue there. And accordingly, no ethylene was detected. Therefore, we were having a stall there on site. One of the hypotheses we had is that, well, uh, originally uh, the nutrients were not considered. I mean, this was uh, almost 10 years ago. So uh, there was not so much science regarding how important nutrients were. However, uh, we measured uh, a nitrogen concentration basically below detection, less than 0.15 milligrams per liter of total killed nitrogen. Therefore, we hypothesize that the sites require some nutrients in order to overcome this stall. And uh, what was done is that we perform a pilot test here and a solution of nutrients, which now we commercialize as PLUS, was added to groundwater samples from the site. You can see here from these graphs that the growth of the halococoides was stimulated and that was demonstrated because the chlorinated compounds from these samples decreased faster and there were no uh, stalls such as you see in the control that uh, it still shows a little bit of vinyl chloride uh, accumulation or, or stalling. So with that in mind, uh, the strategy changed a little bit and more amendments were adding a little bit. Uh, so instead of using just a generic emulsified oil, we supplied uh, nutrients along with it, and that's how the, our product, EOS Pro, was uh, come to be. So this was injected along the already existing, well, uh, the biomentation culture was already there, so we only needed to provide it with uh, EOS Pro, an additional cob off to maintain a proper pH uh, throughout the sites for a longer period of time. 
And you can see the difference here. Basically, after the second injection events, you can see after the second dash line that uh, the DCE and VCE decreased as well. So that uh, demonstrates that basically the stall was overcome. And accordingly, ethylene was observed and produced here. So that means uh, that was another line of evidence to see that the, the, the complete declination was happening. And one contributing factor to that is the fact that pH was stable for years because also, uh, as we saw before, the halococoides is somewhat vulnerable to pH changes. So by providing a nice uh, pH range, uh, that also helps uh, to achieve complete dechlorination. And you can see here, uh, also as an additional line of evidence, this is the population, or well, basically the concentrations of the halopocoides and the respective genes measured through, through my molecular biology tools. And you can see that between the first and the second events, we have some, like, they are injected there, they are kind of surviving, but not really thriving. However, after the second events, after the nutrients were added, basically we have a higher population that was performing uh, the required dechlorination. And uh, here's a comparison on how the sites looked at the beginning. Like this is right before the first injection events. You see the whole plume covering the site. And nowadays, this was uh, reported from last year. Basically, you can see that at least on the source zone that was on the west part of the site, uh, basically the concentration of chlorinated compounds is, uh, well, it's very low now <laughs> compared to what it was. And there are still some areas, but uh, the same strategy is still being followed, so we are confident that uh, the remediation goals will be eventually achieved. So what I want you to learn from this presentation is that, first of all, nutrients are essential. They are very, uh, a very important part on bioremediation as well, uh, when needed, obviously. And uh, from the laboratory, or well, basically from the laboratory results that has been done by several researchers, we can say that adding appropriate nutrients is useful because they can accelerate the removal rates. In our case, uh, from this case study and from several other experiences, we can say that adding nutrients is also useful because it can help in some instances to overcome the stalls of intermediate compounds and uh, sometimes it's very useful to achieve complete rechlorination. And I guess in, the, in this case, because I mean, we are a products company, so we can say that basically our products, uh, one of the important part here, and that's the reason why we are showing this, is because uh, they are designed to include the nutrients, so you uh, can have this part on your side. We have, as I said, products such as EOS Pro, where the nutrients are already incorporated into the BBO. And we also have some, uh, the actual solution in case uh, you are using other required substrates that are purely made of, um, purely made of carbon. So we have uh, several options in order to provide the nutrients required. So this is the end of the presentation. So thank you so much again. Uh, here is my contact information. Uh, I'm mostly the R&D guy here, but if you have also technical questions, you can contact my colleagues. And uh, now I'm open to any question. Thank you. Question in the back, if uh, we could use a microphone for the question. Uh, I, guess, I mean, I can hear you, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, as you wish. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. I have actually a question. So like you isolate different strains to adopt for remediation, right? Uh, well, there are two things happening. Well, there are a lot of things happening there. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, sometimes, uh, or in many sites, the, the chlorination population already is there. Uh, so sometimes or many times people try to see if they are there using molecular biology tools, so that helps. There are several species that are naturally degrading this. Um, there are several cultures, and, and you may come across uh, several vendors that have different uh, biomentation cultures, so those are uh, 
bacteria that are specifically or basically enriched uh, to degrade chlorinated compounds. Uh, and one of them is the one that we use here, uh, BAC9. So basically, it's, uh, it's a microbial community that uh, was exposed to uh, chlorinated compounds and eventually adapts to it. And uh, that helps injecting uh, that into those sites that they don't have it. What uh, about if your bacteria mm -hmm. would not be enough competitive to existing bacteria in the soil? Like they can consume faster your uh -huh. nutrient? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, during the first stages, yeah, you may have some competition because, um, yeah, uh, most of the substrate, for example, uh, emulsified oil, yeah, a lot of bacteria can degrade that. However, there is a point where the concentration of chlorinated compounds is the selecting factor. So the bacteria that, that, that would thrive uh, are the ones that are the chlorinating. And the interesting part here is that once the chlorinated compounds uh, are degraded, well, these bacteria will start dying as well because they cannot compete with the native population. And that's a, that's a big advantage because sometimes people get concerned about uh, how the community there shifts, uh, but eventually, or in many, many cases, the environment gets restored to the, I would say, the natural conditions. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, like, the season would be also a limiting factor, right? Like, you cannot apply your approach in winter time, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a very important that's a very interesting uh, thing because actually, uh, yeah, you are completely right. The temperature is a big factor there. Uh, uh, sometimes, yeah, in colder uh, uh, in colder seasons, you may expect to have uh, lower rates just because the bacteria are well are below their optimal temperature growth. Uh, and it's a big research area in general. I have seen the presentations in, uh, in other conferences where, for example, other technologies like thermal, they are providing somehow a little bit of heat so they can be coupled to bioremediation too. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same as this presentation. I mean, there are like some challenging sites that originally you may think that they are not good for bioremediation uh, originally, but there are ways to overcome uh, the challenge. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. the presentation. Hello. So mm -hmm. we've injected EOS at one of our chlorinated solvent sites, and I was told not to add the B12 to the EOS directly, and I was wondering if that is still the case, and why is that the case? Uh, well, uh, actually, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 that's uh, actually a, a very important thing that people should know. I mean, basically, in that case, it was more on the operational part <laughs> or, or the production of the emulsified oil. We, we were running with some issues trying to blend the vitamin B12 in. Um, Nowadays, actually, just recently, we changed or, or we developed a strategy on like how to, to blend it there. Uh, but yeah, really, it's, it's nothing, it's purely, how to say it, um, on the production side, I will say it. Um, eventually, it doesn't matter because the result is the same. Uh, most of the time, we provide uh, the emulsified oil as a concentrated uh, product, so you dilute it with water, and that's. Uh, where you add the vitamin B12. Uh, in this case, that's, that's one part. Uh, with, our, uh, with our new formulation, uh, it's already incorporated, so yeah, it's the same dilution that is going in. Thank so, you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, well, directly, actually, uh, I would say uh, several months ago, there was somebody that was trying to do that. So technically it's possible, uh, and actually, I mean, there is, uh, how to say, the effects of both things are sometimes supplementary, so, uh, and that's uh, another presentation that my colleagues give some time that uh, basically there are instances where CBI is helpful, especially for lower concentrations. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, we have also a product uh, that is uh, called EOS DVI, where you combine a self-emulsifying solution with, with, uh, with CVI to 
to basically get the best of both worlds by having biotic and abiotic remediation there. Uh, yeah, there is, yeah, I don't think many people have tried actually just pro with that, but definitely, I mean, they, they don't interfere with each other. They basically accomplish different functions. <laughs> Mm, yes. Yes. Um, and uh, in your case study, you seem to uh, not mention about many of those elements. Uh -huh. Is that uh, your amendment include those nutrients already? Uh, well. Or, and uh, then my uh -huh. second part of question yes. is like uh, for a study to evaluate if. Uh, uh, amendment is needed, do, uh, we should uh, test all those nutrients you recommended or just some key elements? Well, that's a great question, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, the list of elements, yeah, I mean, I decided to focus on nitrogen and B12 because you should, I mean, there is a, a science and a, a lot of research group working on that. Um, and in this case, well, uh, first of all, many of those nutrients are provided, uh, they are provided as traces, actually. I mean, the nutrient solution also contains uh, some, some of these elements, but in very uh, uh, small um, concentrations. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to tell, uh, I'm not going to lie, because really uh, not many of them are tested as much as cobalt or vitamin B12, uh, but they are important and uh, many times they are provided by the microbial community itself. Uh, many others, uh, like, well, carbon definitely it's there because you provide a substrate. Uh, oxygen is there also because uh, uh, in our case it's uh, oil, so yeah, oil has also oxygen atoms there. So. So yeah, many of them are uh, basically included, uh, I will say implicitly, uh, but they are there for sure. It's just that, yeah, maybe, maybe some researcher will come about like uh, the importance of other elements, uh, maybe nickel or selenium, uh, yes. Um, that's something that definitely is worth studying. Uh, and yeah, once we know that, maybe we can in keep improving our, our, our products. <laughs> Any more questions? We appreciate everybody hanging out uh, to the last session. Uh, we really appreciate it, and I appreciate everybody's presentation here today. A lot of good questions. We're going to give you eight minutes back, and there is a poster reception starting in about eight minutes um, in the exhibit hall. And don't forget, there's still a, uh, the raffle for the 50-50 is at 6 p.m. So um, 